All right, well, good morning, everybody. Um, everybody hear me? Okay. Um, so let me just begin uh, at, the, at the beginning. So um, simulation of lipids, and I've scanned through some of the previous uh, speakers, so this is not a completely new uh, topic for everybody. But so the nature of the way I've presented this is somewhat of a review, and I will pose some questions and indicate how over the past few years we've arrived at the situation we're currently in. So I think this summarizes very well the, the, the situation. Doing molecular dynamics on the, the kinds of biosystems we're interested in is a real challenge, and, and it involves hand-in-hand um, -hand development of hardware and software, and later today you will hear from Calais about, uh, Sanjay Calais, about the very special advances or some of them that have been carried out here um, in enabling the large-scale simulations, which I think are the future and, and which we all dream about. Also, the hardware. This is an appropriate place to, to think about hardware because uh, Klaus was one of the pioneers in putting together uh, clusters. Uh, since I think more than a decade already, Klaus, right? Since you, you started down that road. Was Transputers, was it your first go? Or you I, yes. So, yeah, so uh, the, 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 having the two together on one campus is pretty unique, and I think this is why this is a wonderful place to have this school. So I think what motivates us all, in a sense, is to think about processes that go on inside a cell, and uh, the reasons for that are pretty obvious, but from the context of my talk about membranes and, and why we should be interested in membranes, I, I'll just give you the bit of history. When I uh, talked to people in biological science groups in the 1980s when the first uh, supercomputer centers became freely available and one could think about studying large systems, the people I spoke to told me, well, there's an awful lot of activity in trying to model proteins, but nobody at all is worrying about the substrates. And large numbers of the proteins um, are found in the membranes. And of course, the membrane is the, the containment of the cell. But it's more complicated than that. And that's why this uh, uh, slide is here, because in, in this region of the cell, in the Golgi apparatus, you, you have lipids sequestered, and, and these lipids are moved around, and cholesterol is also there and shipped around as desired. And also within the cell, you have vesicles, and I'll say a little bit more about that, not very much, these objects which are barely visible in this image. Um, these are vesicle-like objects, again, which are uh, membrane-like, uh, outer membrane to um, encase things. And so understanding the membranes, I think, is, is, uh, is clearly important. At the level of which, uh, of which we begin in the, in the modeling, we, there's a cartoon here from a biochemistry book showing getting down to the detail of the membrane. And it's very complicated, and it's even more complicated than here because these lipids here are drawn as if they are all, or pretty much all the same. But in fact, they're not. Some of them are charged. Some of them have... Uh, other groups attached to them, and uh, the little yellow objects there are the cholesterol. And it's natural when you, you get to my age with gray hair and interact with your doctor with increasing frequency to worry about things like cholesterol and why is it there, for example. 
Um, okay, so the bottom, the bottom bullet here is the key bullet, I think. The whole thing I've shown you is a hierarchy of scales, and we'll say a little bit more about that in the next lecture. But the issue is this is very complicated, and underlying a lot of what's happened is this reductionist model. It's just what we would do if we were chemical physicists, and then you would break down this complicated system into its components, and let's see if we can understand the components, and then move forward to look at things interacting as you, the tools or the techniques you use uh, justify that. So within the, the framework of the membranes, the first thing we, we looked at, certainly in my group and other groups, was to, to focus on membranes and very simple things in membranes. So that really is the uh, introduction to the talk. I, there are lectures on molecular dynamics, so I won't say, say very much, except that from my perspective, these, these are the key bullets that have arisen. The nature, the nature of the systems we're interested in uh, the long-range forces are there, whether we like it or not, that uh, these lipids are often charged. The, uh, at best, there's Witter ionic having positive and negative charges separated by linker uh, carbon atoms. And so it, you, you just can't escape from the long-range forces. So if you come out of condensed, uh, condensed matter from the physics side, this is not a surprise. I mean, it must be 100 years since the physicists understood this inside out. And if you read the, the papers of Max Born and others understanding the dynamics of ionic crystals in the 1920s, they understood how you would handle long-range forces. In fact, I'm sufficiently old that back in 1961, I went to a summer school, much like you, and the lecturers included people like Debye and Ewald and Max Born. So I was very fortunate because these people were very old, naturally. But um, at that meeting, Ewald was asked how did he come up with the idea of doing uh, the Ewald sums, and he said it was the habit in Göttingen, in Born's group, after lunch, everybody would go for a walk. And uh, after the walk, they would come back, and uh, Max Born would sit down at his desk and go to sleep, and the rest of the room had to work quietly. <laughs> and he said... During this walk, he happened to be talking to Dubai about this problem of how do you handle the long-range forces, and Dubai told him what to do. So he said, really, this should be the Dubai way of doing it. But anyway, it's Avon. So that was at a summer school I went to in 1961. And actually, it appears in a, in a book, I think, that came out next year that somebody wrote that down. So um, unfortunately, we can't deal with infinite systems, so... We have to worry about periodically replicating things, periodic boundary conditions. And again, if one goes back into the history, this was extremely controversial in the 1930s. There were people around that didn't believe in periodic boundaries. And actually, eminent people, Nobel Prize winners and the like. However, let's, let's forget about that. I think we're past that. Max Born and others understood that. And I think that that is a reasonable way to proceed for most problems. So the issue is we deal with a small system that's periodically replicated, and statistical mechanics just tells us that the um, average temperature of our system is given from the kinetic energy of all the particles, and unfortunately that isn't sufficient to equilibrate your system. And so I think significant from my perspective was the paper of Hans Anderson at Stanford in 1980 which brought back to the community this notion that you have to worry about these things. Uh, up till that point, anybody attempting molecular dynamic simulations would uh, probably do it in, in the microcanonical ensemble and uh, not worry too much because it just happens automatically. But if you have proteins in water, it is important to understand that you want the water and the protein at the same temperature. Now, there are rival ways of dealing with this problem, and I'm taking the liberty of a speaker and give you my perspective, and I think that's the way historians deal with science. You see it through your own eyes, and it's silly to try and change that. So I think the next most important event was a postdoc in my group, Suichi Noze, that wrote his paper on the um, thermostats, and that was received with great hostility by the community. Again, a good example for young people that just because papers get a hard time from referees doesn't mean they're not good papers because history is written later. It isn't written by contemporary people. So Suichi Noze's paper led to a whole slew of other papers. Some people call it, call it the Noze Hoover, 
And I think that's actually a scandal because uh, Bill Hoover was one of the worst opponents of Nose's work. And so uh, I remember a nice discussion with Suichi Nose when his paper was rejected by Journal of Chemical Physics. And I told him to put in some citations to Bill Hoover's work and it would probably get published. And in fact, that was good advice. So nothing ever changes. So the next thing I want to deal with is the, the notion of how you do more efficient integration of equations of motion. And again, I'm not going to spend any time on it. I think there were great contributions, and, and I think that's helped all of us. And then, as I already alluded, I think there are a number of visionaries around that realize that you've got to get into parallel computing, and I think this will be for people that follow me. So what I'm going to go through now is a few slides. These were made up about seven or eight years ago, so apologize if some of the things are a little out of date. So I think when we got into modeling membranes, it's extremely important that we were able to do simulations at constant pressure, constant temperature, or stress, whichever way you want to look at it, that we could let the system adapt. Uh, up till now, we have not done grand canonical simulations, and in fact, that's a possibly a limitation of a lot of work up to this point. So if anybody wants a good problem to think about, you should think about perhaps uh, how one might uh, handle that. So I think you've had lectures on forces. I think the standard, standard approach is very much in the mold of the charm uh, people and, 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 and the other groups is to break, break down into intramolecular and intermolecular components. The intermolecular part is pretty much solidly uh, Leonard Jones-like in, in various forms. And um, I would say I spent a decade of my life uh, studying intermolecular potentials for argon atoms, the simplest you can find, and krypton and neon. And I can tell you that the Leonard Jones potential is no good. So even in the simplest systems, this is actually a pretty poor representation of an intermolecular force. It's certainly a cartoon of an intermolecular force. And if you go back and read Leonard Jones papers in the 1920s and 30s, you'll find that the 12 came about so that they could actually do an analytical integration of the second real coefficient, if it was 12. But uh, there's no other real reason for that. And having two parameters was essentially, uh, you knew the density of something, which gave you a length scale, and you knew the sublimation energy of a solid, and that gave you an energy scale. So two parameters, and that's how you are. It has no more rigor than that. Uh, if, if you look, say, at Leonard Jones' potential for argon or xenon and compare it with the best results out of chemical physics over the last 30, 40 years, you'll find that the well depth would be about 20% in error, for example, and the coefficient of the long-range force here would be out by a factor of two. So bear that in mind. If it doesn't work for argons, this is going to be a gross simplification uh, for other things as well, not even to mention the omission of many body forces, such as polarization interactions and the like. So we're dealing with effective interactions, and these are parameterized to do the best job they can. So that's enough of that. Tiny bit of history of where we, where we come from, and I think, again, when you're my age, it's important to realize that the modern, modern notions, uh, when I was working on rare gas crystals, it was only then that the notion of what a membrane really was was emerging from the community. And the model we use now, the one here, uh, this uh, model of Singer and Nicholson, dates from 1972. And uh, it, as I say, this is surprisingly recent in, in, in the notion of those as a dis I mean, in that er era, we were certainly trying to simulate uh, using molecular dynamics, all sorts of things. And uh, of course, we hadn't thought about trying to do lipids, but fortunate in a sense, because we didn't. I mean, nobody really knew at that point. So the, uh, this is, goes back to the slide at the beginning. It's a mixture. You have different kinds of lipids. You have proteins, cholesterol, and so on. And how do we move forward? So the first work in my group uh, focused on uh, lipid DPPC with 16 carbon atoms in each chain that's, that's shown here. Um, the, the identical length, the no unsaturated bonds in, in the model we use, just because of the ease of parameterization of the forces. And when we started, uh, started down that road of simulating uh, lipid membranes, there were no potentials. I mean, basically, we had to, the group had to make its own potentials, even for the lipids. Uh, fortunately, there are at least a couple of sets out there now where other people have done a really fine job. 
So how do you go about doing the simulations? And this is the work of Doug Tobias I'm talking about now. Doug is now at uh, UC Irvine, got his tenure a few months ago. And this is work that Doug did with me starting about 10 years ago, actually more than 10 years ago. Um, the notion is what we really want to simulate is a chunk of a multilamellar vesicle. So I should remind you that these membranes, when you produce a single, you take a single lipid and you produce it, you can get different kinds of uh, assemblies. These liposomes or multilamellar vesicles are just one form, one phase that's available for these lipids. And very often in your, in your system, you would have an object like this onion and uh, it would be in, in solution it would be in equilibrium with other objects and other kinds of assemblies. So what we have in mind in the simulation is to pick out a little piece of a multilamellar vesicle. And this is exactly what people who do NMR studies or neutron scatter scattering or X-ray scattering from these systems. They do not typically study just a cell. When they produce one of these model systems, to get increased signal, they actually produce a stack of these and if it was an NMR experiment, this would serve as the, the normal to these bilayers would serve as where the magnetic field would go, for example, the director. So when we set up the simulation, we are imagining that we're looking at a piece of this periodically replicated. I mean, it could have cholesterol in it, and indeed that's one of the systems that Doug studied. So the next thing to know is that um, the structure and the nature of these these membranes depends on the temperature. If you, uh, there are many, many phases known. The simplest way to think about it is the low temperature phase is a little bit solid like the gel phase. The high temperature phase is a liquid crystal phase, which is the physiologically relevant phase for uh, biology. Um, and in between, there is a phase transition. In fact, it's even more complicated than that. There are other phases. So one thinks of subgel phases and in between here, we have so-called ripple phases, where instead of the, the layers being flat like that, you have long wavelength undulations frozen in with a repeat distance of about 200 lipids or so. So it's a very complicated system. But fortunately for us, in a sense, for the biological part, we're at the higher temperature. And uh, because it's a mixture with things in it, it's usually in a fluid, a fluid state. So this shows a um, snapshot from one of Doug Tobias' early simulations. And I, I'd like to say, just for, for the record, um, this was actually run at Pittsburgh on, on a cray um, at the time. And used uh, to get that image was our whole year's computing was 2,000 hours on this machine. And uh, I mean, now you would probably run this on a laptop. I imagine, but uh, at that time it was really a tour de force to do that. We were not the first in our group. As I said, Klaus, uh, I can remember well, he, at one point I think he set up 200 lipids and, and, and ran with his, his uh, home-built machine. Um, also the Berenson group and, and Terry Stouch, who was working in industry, also did some simulations. But, but these groups, uh, uh, you know, in, for the record, never used uh, Avalt sums, never put in long-range forces, uh, never had the, the pressure control done properly and various other things. So, in fact, these first pioneering calculations are not so useful, I would say. I think the success that we had, so to get the parameters, I mentioned that there weren't parameters at that time, and so Dr. Bias and the graduate student, uh, Kechuan Chu, fitted to various things. And this is just to give you an idea of the kinds of uh, systems that were used in the fitting procedures. And they're sort of obvious. They went to model crystals and alkane liquids and so on and solids. And in the end, uh, trying to make sure, as I said before, that the densities uh, of these uh, model fitting uh, things worked out OK. Um, when we were all said and done, simulations were performed in the gel phase and the liquid crystal phase, and these two images are drawn to scale to give you an idea of the difference in density. So this is the physiologically relevant phase. This is one where we learn more about the structure. And the level of agreement we got is down there at the 
2 or 3% level at worst for parameters. So I think it was in a good situation um, at that point, and I, I think encouraged a lot of other people to move aggressively into this area. The, let me back up here a minute. The gel phase is an extremely important one to think about from the, the point of view of pinning down your parameters because if you look here, you'll see these alkane chains have a certain order. In fact, if you were to be able to examine it very carefully, about five carbon atoms at the end of each chain are somewhat disordered and the head groups are, 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 have a strange kind of arrangement. But be that as it may, the order in the chains leads to in-plane diffraction from X-rays. So if you scatter X-rays in the plane of the molecules, you can pick up an orthorhombic cell. Uh, this was done by the group in Pittsburgh at Carnegie Mellon. And you can even impute the tilt angle of these chains. And, and the, these models were more or less qualitative. Other tests, um, there was some fabulous work done in the 1970s with neutrons where somebody went in and isotopically substituted the hydrogens on each of the carbons making up the chain here and used neutron diffraction to measure the spacing between the, let's say, the C5 carbon here and the C5 carbon there and systematically went through the whole set of lipids with these isotopic substitution and is able to measure this distance D between equal atoms on each half of the bilayer. And this is a plot of the neutron diffraction versus the simulation. And I think that was a stunning success for the kinds of approach that, uh, that the community now use. I don't want to say much about that. Okay, so that was the situation in the middle 1990s. And as I said, other groups, particularly the groups at NIH, uh, Venables and, and collaborators, uh, uh, Rich Pasta comes to mind, and, and, and certainly other people now routinely do simulations. So there are sets of parameters in AMBA, CHARM. Alex Macarell has systematically refined these parameters. They exist now for double bonds and so on. Uh, what we were interested, um, this is supposed to be a liquid crystal. So um, we were not aware that anybody had ever run an MD simulation long enough to actually see molecules diffuse past their nearest neighbors. And so when a new graduate student, Carlos Lopez, started, we thought we would have a look at that. Um, and maybe uh, uh, Klaus had done that, but, but I wasn't aware of anybody publishing that. So this, this brings up a, a side issue here where in, in, in recent work, we've been criticized by the way we prepare our, uh, our samples. And I just bring this up again because um, these are issues. This, it's a small system. How do you do that? So I think the easiest way to prepare a lipid sample right now might be just go to a website. Go to Klaus's website. Do you have a lipid system that people can download? You can get it at Pittsburgh. Yeah, the collection has to be by, I suggested, by Rockefeller. He collects liquids and power towers are distributed down the hall. Yeah. Yeah, or my cells or whatever. Yeah, I, I agree. So um, typically what we've, what we've done historically was to, to do um, what was indicated here. Um, then there's another issue, I, I, maybe it was addressed in the earlier lectures, and we got into trouble in a recent paper when we were inserting something into the membrane. And, and the way Carlos did it is indicated here. He put in a, 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 a sort of chain of ghost-like particles that, that pushed the lipids around, and we got into a lot of trouble for trying to do it that way. I mean, we were told we should have a library of lipid conformations and pick the ones that fit or do some. I won't name the name of the person that was probably the referee, but um, there's still a lot of cookery attached to setting up simulations, and I, I don't know if, this is, if you can get into discussions with people. It's, it's non-standard, I would say. Yeah. Okay, well. Okay. But these are issues, right? I mean, uh, how, how one does that? 
Okay, so then go back to what I said. The motivation for the study was really to see, uh, see what is the sort of time scale. I mean, you can do a back of the envelope estimate and convince yourself that it's going to be in the range 10 to 100 nanoseconds that you, you need to run as a trajectory to see anything useful. Uh, Talos actually ran 10 nanoseconds and was able to observe, uh, you know, like the cosmic ray that made one event and see... Uh, <laughs> came through his system and one lipid happened to pass through uh, the nearest neighbor to cage shell. So that brings up a separate issue, I think. So if you're trying to do your ensemble average and you're doing averages over your trajectory, um, it might make sense not to run 10 nanoseconds so that at least you're averaging over some local conformations. But if just a few of your lipids start to make long jumps, this could perhaps screw up your statistics because now really you badly sampled that. And so these are other issues about you should bear in mind that this is, again, non-trivial. So mean square displacement, I mean, it looks like this is a beautiful curve. It looks like you can pull off the, the diffusion constant. And um, if you look closely at the data, it does still seem to be changing a bit. Um, uh, in the different regions. And then when you go to the literature, you find that um, you can more or less pick the number you want. So the, these models are quantitative. If you, if you look through that, you, these are all respectable, respectable experiments. And uh, you can see the, you can pick your number anywhere from 0.2 to 0.8 or something. And, you, and, and there are some studies that really are much, much, much too much. So I would say that the, the, the models appear to be very good. This is actually, um, is, is uh, fortunate, I would say, but um, nonetheless interesting. I show here the centers of mass of uh, one, one leaflet. Uh, again, this is meant to be a liquid, a liquid crystal, and this is in, 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 any, in no sense does this look like a, a sort of triangular lattice. So, um, because the molecules can change their shape, different, um, different lipids occupy effectively different... Uh, uh, different areas. If you if you tessellate this into the Voronoi uh, um, polyhedra, you'll you'll find that there is a distribution of areas they occupy. If anything, there is a hint of perhaps some dimerization, and this may come about because of the the salt bridging between the charged head groups. Similarly, for the orientations of the of the dipoles that make up the head groups. If you look, this is one snapshot and trying to show you that some some of these are standing more or less vertical, pointing out normal, others are more or less in the plane. So there are the distributions of these things that you see. And I, another important issue which seems to be coming up more and more now is what is the nature of water right at the polar interface? I, I had a paper to referee, I won't name names just recently, where a group had used some very clever optical means to study water it, that's uh, against the lipid bilayer. And so I think these are issues that could eventually give us good tests on our models because the, it's not clear that the water models and the water interacting with the polar lipid head groups has been parameterized very carefully. So this ultimately could be useful. What about putting things in the lipid bilayer? So one of the first things that uh, in my group we put in there, Doug, Dr. Bias put in a few cholesterol molecules. And uh, because of the nature of the way the simulations were done here, the, the, the use of 50 degrees was to make sure that we were really in the liquid crystal phase, the DPPC, and to watch the cell uh, change its parameters in response to having, um, having the solutes, as it were, in there and measuring what happens to orientational order parameters. But let me go back, and I think this is the sort of take-home message um, that I want to get across, is that if you look at your lipid, uh, individual lipid molecules on a 10 picosecond time scale, so this is a superposition of 10 images of a particular lipid, and the closest waters hydrating, uh, hydrating the lipid, uh, superposed on each other. This is a superposition of 10 spaced by 10 picoseconds, and then there was another 7 here uh, spaced by 100 picoseconds. And you can see that is, you've got to get into, obviously, multi-nanoseconds to see real diffusion, but nevertheless, on this time scale, you can see that they've 
do start to move. But when you do the same thing for a lipid that's against a cholesterol molecule, see how the cholesterol dampens this motion and causes a stiffening. Now, of course, this is known experimentally through all sorts of studies, uh, neutrons, um, x-rays, NMR particularly. The most interesting motions of the cholesterol was the bobbing up and down uh, and the wiggling around, which has been confirmed by neutron studies. But I think this is dramatic to show you what does cholesterol do to, to the, the lipids in the bilayer. Okay, other things that we've been interested in, in, in my group, are stimulated by beautiful experiments, is the, the fact that lipids can solubilize DNA. And, and a simulation was done by a couple of people in my group where uh, they, they borrowed from really beautiful experiments by Cyrus Sapinha from UC Santa Barbara and a postdoc at the time, Joachim Radler, that's now a professor back in Germany, where they measured the structure of a complex of lipid with DNA. So what they found, in fact, was that you, you get a sandwich formed of the, the DNA, the alpha helix coming through here, and uh, you've, you've got the lipids and the waters, and you get this sort of sandwich structure, and they were able to impute this from their X-ray scattering. I should say one more thing is, of course, because of the phosphate groups here, you need counter ions and salt. And what Joachim Radler did um, was to replace some of the cations which are needed to neutralize the, the phosphate groups by a cationic lipid. And he, show, he did a whole systematic study of the structure as a function of the ratio of switter ionic lipid to cationic lipid. And the simulation in the end that we attempted was for a, a system that, that essentially uh, the, the negative charges on the DNA are exactly compensated by positive charges on cationic lipid. That's a simulation that we did to try and see what is the role of the, the various components and how does the, cation, the cationic lipid interact with the DNA. That's what we were trying to do. So here's a view of the uh, two views of the simulation system. It was uh, just because of the repeat distance of the DNA, it turned out that we, we chose to use a relatively short piece. This is the DNA and it's replicated here. And we had a, a, a mixed set of lipids and they're color-coded to distinguish between the cationic and, and neutral lipids. Uh, simulation was run, uh, this was already done a few years ago now, but it was run for five nanoseconds, and the object of, of the run was to try and understand how these, these polar lipids interact with the DNA, as I say. Well, what was the conclusion? The conclusion, uh, of, of the run, I mean, one could argue about whether it was long enough, um, was a surprise at first sight. Um, let me talk you through this image. So this is one of the phosphate groups, and we distinguish between those oxygens on the phosphate which are covalently linked to the backbone and those oxygens which are exposed to solvent. And then this shows the density distribution plots around these uh, oxygens of uh, water or counter iron, as it were, the counter iron in this case being the N plus from the choline group of the lipid. And we found essentially equal probability of finding a Zwitter ionic lipid neutralizing or the cationic lipid neutralizing the oxygen charge. So at first sight for us, that was a surprise. So one then digs into the simulation to try and find out how does that happen? And what happens is the cationic lipids uh, can also dimerize with regular lipids because if you have a positive charge at the end of this lipid, it can find the phosphate group, head group on a lipid and pair up. And in this dimerization, as it were, or salt bridging, it causes the Zwitter ionic lipid to stand normal to the interface. And by standing normal to the interface, it helps it reach up to 
uh, bridge to the DNA if we look at the sides. So if you, if you dimerize here and, and help one of these lipids point out normal to the interface, this is an efficient way to neutralize the system. So that was one of our conclusions. And then there's a corollary to this that if you have no DNA at all and you just look at the lipid mixture, the lipid, the mixture of the cationic and the zwitterionic lipid, uh, then if you were to probe the orientation of the head groups, you should see an extra propensity for the, the, the dipole to stand normal to the interface. And NMR experiments uh, were carried out by a group in Switzerland that, that confirmed that. So this, this mechanism seems to be an, an efficient one for enabling a lipid to solubilize DNA. Um, there are a number of questions remain, and I think I, I bring this up because I'm not aware of any group I mean, we've set up some simulations where I said at the beginning we're trying to mimic a multilamella system, uh, but I don't know anybody that's actually done a multilamella simulation. Now, as computers get every two or three years, you can get an order of magnitude more. Um, I'm not aware of anybody that has made any attempt to expand the unit cell of the simulation uh, to see what the effect is. And th there's uh, ample theory out there to tell us that stability of these lamellar systems, the fluctuations in the membrane should talk to each other. I mean, there are many, many papers about that. And at the moment, our system, because of periodic boundaries, is infinitely correlated. Uh, we, we set up some systems, uh, uh, but have not run them to a conclusion. And one of the things we want to know is if the lamellar spacing is effective if we double the system, and is the spacing between the DNA, is there any evidence of dimerization, uh, anything strange going on. So these are questions, I think, for the future as, as we get more and more computer time available. Um, of course, there's a myriad things that are interesting to put in, in lipid bilayers. If you're, if you're interested in what happens to the detergent you use to wash your clothes, what that does to the ecosystem, then it would be natural to worry about how surfactants interact with the lipid membranes. And that's one of the things uh, we studied with John Shelley, a former graduate student of mine that's at Procter & Gamble, trying to under, or was at Procter & Gamble at the time, to see how this surfactant interacts with the lipid membranes. We're also interested in to find out what happens if you put different salts in there, particularly multivalent ions. And again, this would be talk in its own right. But just to give you an idea, of the kinds of things that are interesting to study um, and, and have relevance. <coughs> Another subject which is very dear to my heart is trying to figure out what happens if anesthetics or small molecules go into lipid bilayers. And this is important in the whole area of anesthesiology. In fact, uh, um, we even published some of this in the journal called Anesthesiology. I think the, the, this community is, is suddenly sensitized to the notion that these molecules are going in and affecting <coughs> cells and they really want to know quantitatively what's going on. So just to give you one example, um, a, a typical um, sort of generic anesthetic halothane, it's actually not so widely used anymore because of toxicity, but it's, it's, a, it's a classic anesthetic in a sense. We studied how this is distributed in a lipid bilayer. And uh, there's some images here of showing the convergence of what happens. Uh, in the end, you, you, you find there is some propensity to stay in water, and then there's the partitioning into the middle of the membrane. And in fact, one of the conclusions from, from our study is that the halothane will segregate not only in the middle of the bilayer in the famous methyl trough where there's a relatively low density, but also will hang around up by the water, up by the polar head groups uh, because water gets in underneath the head groups and so you also find halothane there. Uh, th these observations from the simulation explained uh, some NMR data that were a puzzle in the sense that uh, halothane was studied in water by NMR, the fluorine uh, resonances were studied, and the inferences about the structure were that in the presence of a lipid bilayer, there was very little change in the NMR signal, and that was not explained. And uh, our findings that there's a tendency for a, a number of the molecules to aggregate 
un in the bilayer, but nevertheless in the vicinity of the water, I think, gave at least partial rationalization of why, uh, why this result was noted. Another interesting thing in the community of anesthesiology is the fact that two molecules which look at first sight to be very similar uh, have different effects as, a, as a, an anesthetic. So an anesthetic has to do three things. It has to, first of all, put you to sleep, and you have to be able to, to wake up. Uh, 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 I mean, ideally. Another, another thing is amnesia. In, in other words, you, you, when you wake up, you don't want to remember the torture that uh, you've been through, okay? But there's a third very, very important uh, quality that, that, that these molecules must satisfy is that you must be immobile. The surgeon doesn't want you getting up in the middle of the operation. So even though sleepwalking, as it were. So there are many molecules that can do two out of the three things, and of course, that's not useful. So this is a molecule which will put you to sleep, you will wake up, but you are thrashing around on the operating table, apparently. Uh, I don't know if they've actually done it with people, but certainly maybe with animals. And so the issue is, how does that behave when this molecule goes into the lipid bilayer? And what we found in our simulations was that the distribution um, this doesn't have a, ver a very much propensity to hang around, as I said before, in, in proximity of the water, that it really likes to be in the hydrocarbon part much more. And uh, so that's an interesting observation. That's the w it, also, it also changes the, the bilayer. The distribution within the lipid bilayer is different then the parameters that characterize the bilayer are different. The, the, the aerial density per lipid is changed. The thickness of the bilayer is altered and so on. And you might imagine then that in a real cell wall where you have membrane proteins, these changes in the thickness and local density would also affect the properties of ion channels, let's say, and the like. And that is the current uh, theory, I would say, of, of action. Okay, other areas, I haven't said much about unsaturated lipids in, in, in the real systems. The lipids are, are unsaturated, and we've done in, in my group and many, many other groups now a study of a, a very bizarre lipid, actually. Um, a famous NMR spectroscopist nagged me for several years. It could be as much as a decade to look at this particular lipid. It, it's uh, found in the vision system and other places, and it, this lipid has two arms. One of them has got 18 carbon atoms with no double bonds. The other arm there is 22 carbon atoms and six double bonds. And it's, it's kind of strange that nature would use um, a lipid like that. At, and certainly at room temperature, 16 of these is, so, is solid. It, it doesn't melt to something like 45 Celsius. So 18 would be probably 65 Celsius. And now you've got a chain with 22 carbon atoms. So this should be a wax. So why would nature use a wax? I mean, that wouldn't be useful. But in fact, it isn't a wax. And it's because you have this asymmetry and disorder. So the puzzle, the puzzle was, what does this system look like? And Leonor Saiz in the group uh, did a, a simulation. Of, it's a modest-sized system, but nevertheless did that and studied the behavior of, of this system. And there were some strange structures that seemed to come out of it. The, the presence of these double bonds enable this sort of corkscrewing around the, um, the straight chains of the C18s and some strange, bizarre attempts to kind of phase separate these, these two kinds of chains. And uh, the textbook pictures that you find if you look in the literature of lipids, that this is the structure if, if you do an idealized structure setting up the double bonds. I mean, we actually see in the simulations configurations something, these really extreme uh, tortured lipids. And I think that's the reason it stays fluid. Now, the mechanical properties of this, of this bilayer are, uh, I think, very interesting. And that's why you have it in, in these particular applications. Anybody interested can go look at the paper. The issue of what the head group dipoles do by the presence of these unsaturated bonds is something, you, again, anybody interested could go back and look at our, our papers. Um, so lastly, um, 
I, I've sort of gone through a whole range of applications of lipids and things in lipids. I just want to say a few words about attempts to study a peptide bundle in uh, a lipid bilayer. Of course, um, it, anybody doing these kinds of simulations, it's, it, it's the frontier in a sense is to study ion channels and we're all very, um, very interested in the structures when they come out and, and they stimulate a lot of work. But I want to say something about that is that uh, when, when you get a crystal structure um, that gets published, and, and it's fantastic to give us some insight into the structure, but we should bear in mind that the structure is, uh, is just that. It is a crystal structure. So this thing is in a solid situation. This is not a structure typically of an isolated functioning ion channel. So there is an act of faith of loading this up into an MD simulation and running it and, and uh, hoping that the relaxations on the time scale of the study are sufficient to um, give us a really equilibrated system. The one we chose to study has been, been done by many others was um, because of a former colleague of mine, Stan Opella, and, and his longtime collaborator in San Diego, a, a channel physiologist, Montal, Opeller is now also in, in San Diego. Um, what they did is they studied peptide bundles. So let me talk you through this famous structure of acetylcholine receptor ion channel. Uh, Unwin has probably spent 20 or 30 years of his life studying this thing. The, the basic structure is a, is a, is a five-helix bundle. Each of, each of these consists of four alpha helices. And the, the structure as we know it, the lining of this inner four is one particular helix. It's the same helix, so-called M2. So the pore is controlled, or the lumen is controlled by a five helix bundle of uh, about 25 amino acid residues set up as alpha helices. So what these guys did is they actually just synthesized this 25 residue amino acid and studied this in lipid, reconstituted lipid bilayers as a model system. And if you read the paper, I think the paper came out in 1999 in Nature Structural Biology or whatever it is, um, they claim that this is a functioning, uh, a functioning channel like center, and that's why we tried to set this up. Um, so there's the sequence, but I, I think in detail, let's not worry about it. It's largely hydrophobic, as you would expect. And um, this is a system that was studied by Leonor Saiz. It's a typical sort of system. She, she set up five of these peptides, a bunch of waters and lipids and a few counter ions and so on and so on. Um, I bring this up because I think this highlights another limitation of trying to do such simulations, and I think there's truth in lending is very important. If you want to study a five helix bundle, um, we really would like to see this self-assemble. I mean, we don't know, uh, and the NMR hasn't given us the information on the relative orientations of these peptides with respect to each other. And so this is a five helix bundle, how Leonor set up the start, but we don't really know the orientation around here of these, and we don't know if they're all the same. We don't. So this is a problem when we want to do a bundle. We can't usually run long enough to watch this thing self-assemble. Now, if there was a crystal structure for this where all the atoms were, we could, of course, load it up. But in fact, in these peptide systems, we don't know that. The other thing we don't know is whether it really is a pentamer. I mean, they say it's a pentamer, but it could be a whole ensemble. There could be some tetramers, some hexamers, and these things could be in exchange on a long time scale. We don't know that. All right, but nevertheless, that's, um, that's typically how you would set up such a system. You try to more or less guess on the base of, basis of a um, bit of intuition and hydropathy plots as to what would be the likely orientation. So Leonor sets set it up and she, she runs it and we set it up with a decent sized uh, pore um, so that it is in fact a channel and this is uh, one nanosecond is typically what you need to equilibrate the lipids around this, and this seems to be 
a nice channel-like object, and this seems to be great. Um, and then you run it for a bit, and you can see you're starting starting configuration. This is showing the orientation of the uh, alpha helix with respect to the bilayer normal. And one of the numbers that Appella did measure was the average tilt of the peptide bundle. And this is this solid line through here, 12 plus or minus 1 degree. <coughs> and you can see that these uh, peptides start to converge to something comparable to the experimental number, one of the few hard numbers that are actually there. Um, so, interesting. Let's see. Well, how many waters are there in the channel? The, there's about 60. Let's see. Very nice. So, but then what happens if you run beyond two nanoseconds? Well, water starts to come out of the channel. Um, so, this is four nanoseconds. Here I'll show you uh, the composite. In fact, the channel on a seven nanosecond run, the channel actually closes and expels most of the water. Now, this is a phenomenon that we've observed before studying a viral ion channel, which was a four helix bundle, and we noticed closing and opening of bundles on these multi-nanosecond timescales. Um, the, these bundles can sort of twist and they can breathe, and uh, residues can hydrogen bond or even salt bridge to each other, polar residues, and close the channel. So I, I bring this up as, again, a caveat. What are the sort of timescales that we look at? It, one can interpret this result in one of many ways, that the force field is wrong. Um, we don't know that. This could be just a fluctuation that actually occurs in the real peptide bundle, and we haven't run long enough to see it open again. It could be that this is a disastrous consequence of a bad initial condition. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know. So, despite the wonders of being able to do these MD simulations, I, I, the message I want to get across is still accessing long enough time scales and, and knowing enough about our system to watch it assemble spontaneously into this, quotes, correct structure are still issues. And I, I'm not going to say much more about that. The detailed analysis is, uh, so I think this is an appropriate point to stop. I've taken you through a whole bunch of applications that have been of interest to my group, uh, putting things in there, be they anesthetic molecules, be they ions, be they surfactants and small peptides. And I, I think the bottom line is, although we can do these calculations, we're only at the very, very beginning. I think there are as many questions posed as there are questions answered, perhaps more unanswered questions. So I think this is an area of great opportunity in the future. So do we take a break at this point or how do? No, no. I'm not going to say what is the answer on my soul. This is the history of the field. There are, of course, Berenson uh, went early on in this approach to simulation of very, very few liquids, I think. Maybe 30, 40 liquids in a bilayer, even 50 liquids right. in, in the bottom. And then we set out the, the design and built a parallel computer for the specific purpose doing a real larger simulation in 1988, in which there are men in 1989 who worked day and night, and then we computed for three years, so 1992, on this computer, and it uh, got finally result in the middle of the year, wrote up a paper, submitted it at the end of the year, and it was published, uh, sort of, uh, I think, first part of 1993, with 200 lipids, Within that period of boundary condition, and so you know that the simulation was so much from the roof, uh, I think, from what I saw there in 1995. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And uh, so they were clearly very in advance, and you know that I, I was really always very, very positive and like praised for this year's work, and you know, so that's the bias. But if you pull it back, 
that compared in many respects very well the, uh, the experiment when we compared with, uh, with the uh, X-ray data of, of, uh, of uh, Steve Weiss and of the MMR data from the Wagel group. And, uh, and so we could really show that uh, uh, you know, there is really an opportunity. You said that afterwards the field really exploded. And I think this is probably due to your work already at the time you needed our work. It sounds like it because it is new generation. It takes an enormous time. Exactly. You know, you, I think before the paper comes out, probably two years earlier, you're already very serious in the middle of designing your work. But uh, I just wanted to say that because it sounds uh, it is, you know, we were very early there. We, we, uh, we got many citations for this paper. So I don't have a reason to complain about it. It's wonderful. No, I, I totally agree. I, I but it is it was also a factor, you know, like we really we really bloodied our to do it. And we felt it's such an important thing to do that we said, okay, we are we are just pretty physicists, let's still try to build our own computer. And uh, so it was really like a long-range vision. I just like to say that. I, I think it's it's good that you say that um, because I mean that's the truth. I mean that's really what happened. You know, I, I didn't want to in any way minimize that contribution. And for, the, for, the, for the young I people here, I would like to say that you know, there was a first generation. It was done with bloody hands and it was tough, tough work. But then it came really the next elegant step from the from the flying group, and uh, we, we really showed we are doing something back here as you know like a, a 200 nit simulation of you know 57,000 atoms. You cannot describe for cannot claim it for for for, for uh, 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 methodological rigidity and push things down. I don't mean intimidated by paper like. Area, we had to try for the same accuracy and level that, for example, Thomas Mecca physics has nowadays. And I think that your work is really uh, doing exactly that. You know, if you read these papers and these little simulations, then you know you realize that there are people who really spent a lot of intellectual effort to be sure that these systems are being treated with the same dignity and, and respect for for intellectual rigor as people have been treating earlier the crystals. And so in this regard, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the reason we are treated. Well, these are the people that did the work, actually. <laughs> I mean, you shouldn't minimize the thing. But I, I think that's very elegantly put, Klaus. I, I absolutely agree. The, um, the, our effort started with the Berenson paper, which actually I got to referee. It was from Journal of Chemical Physics, and it was submitted as a simulation of a lipid bilayer, but if you looked at it at the end, it became a solution of lipids. In fact, the lipid bilayer wasn't stable. And then eventually the paper did come out as a simulation of a symmetric <laughs> something or other. Uh, and, and again, reading the paper carefully to get the thing to even be approximately stable there's a one sentence in there said that they scale the electrostatic interaction by a factor of four. So I mean, I mean, the, so that was the state of the art. Okay, <laughs> I mean, uh, just to get anything that in the length of run they could do that was looking anything like a real system. Um, so I, I think very elegantly put that, that Doug and other people in my group at that time worked for from. 1989, essentially, uh, through to the, well, the papers came out in 95, so, so it wasn't simple. But now it's simple, right? <laughs> you have NAMD, <laughs> you set it up, and you run. It's still a big challenge. Oh. And, uh, I, think, I think it's really um, a very wise uh, point to make. Try to get your, your lipids, your membranes, almost used as a drug 
support up that you put your hand in. A big bu bucket or a big magic water or a very special, very nice distributed mentor and everybody will do work for you. All right, that's it. Please. The membrane structure? Yes. Well, usually when you start a simulation, you have in mind an experiment that you want to compare with. And, and very often in the biophysics and community, um, they will tend to be on model systems. There would be a lipid or a lipid mixture, but mostly a, a one component lipid with, say, a peptide in it or an ion channel or something. So by looking at the experiment, you will see they would maybe it's run with 10% of one lipid and 90% of another. And usually we would just do the 100% and not bother about the 10% uh, of the uh, extraneous uh, lipid. Um, the issue of lipid phase is, is, a, is a very relevant one. But again, the experiment would tell you whether this is a liquid crystalline phase or was it a gel phase. And in fact, you need to read the papers carefully because a lot of, ex not a lot, some experiments are done in the gel phase for very cryptic reasons because it isn't moving around. And um, that's the tougher system to study, in fact, because now you have the problem of inserting an impurity into a crystal-like system, and that's tough. So usually, the, I say, usually there's an experiment that you want to compare with. So in Klaus's uh, case, if you set up an ion channel that this thing is crystallized, say, you know where some of the lipids are even, right? Some. So usually these, these particular lipids have at least one double bond, which encourages the fluidity. It's more difficult to pack in a crystalline order. So there's at least one double bond, typically the most common, isn't it? POPC or? But you're perfectly right. In case that you have experiments with artificial membranes, and of course you take those, because then you have exactly the system that has been measured. But we are not always so fortunate, and then we are oh. involved in the process of and if you speak to people that do ion channel measurements, channel physiologists, there's a kind of folklore amongst them. They also use particular kinds of lipids to help them make stable bilayer films. Uh, DiFi is one of the ones they use, which is uh, going down the carbon chain has a methyl group every fourth carbon atom. For some reason, that makes a very... St this is a lipid that we studied many years ago, prompted by these, uh, e these experimental... As far as we could tell, it just gives the chain um, a, a little bit more size to it and, and also uh, makes it better match to the head group. So it, it seems to stabilize the membrane. So as I said, the bottom line is usually experiment tells you what you want to do. Yes. Um, well, this is the your background from solid state physics. I mean, if you want to simulate a box of water and you use a cube, it's actually the most inefficient way to do it. If you were to do, use the Wigner-Seitz cell and, and put it in the appropriate polyhedron, you can put twice the number of water molecules into the box with periodic boundaries. Instead of packing in a simple cubic lattice, you pack in an FCC lattice or a BCC lattice or whatever. So when you, when you want to look at systems in two dimensions that would intrinsically pack in, say, a triangular lattice or a hexagonal lattice, the natural axes for that are oblique at 60 degrees. So the, you, if you want to conserve computer time, of, of course, the, the coding of that you, it, through the periodic boundaries brings another complication. So you gain something, but the code has to be able to do that. And since my group came out of phase transitions in molecular crystals where 
high temperature phases might be cubic and you cool it down and they distort, they might go monoclinic or they might go orthorhombic. Those kinds of degrees of freedom are buried in our code and, and so it didn't make a difference. I mean, we could set up any way you want. So basically to save computer time. We are only a V or P for the core of, of uh, forces that might artificially change your geometry, keeping the volume for a constant by changing the geometry of the cell. Okay, so um, that's a good question and one I should have um, answered through the talk. So if you're setting up a liquid crystal phase, it's a liquid. So if you en 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 enable full degrees of freedom of the cell that can clot, this liquid crystal is, has no response to shear. So if due to somehow the random fluctuations in this cell it starts to tilt a bit to make what would appear to be a little monoclinic distortion, there is no restoring force. The only thing that's saving you is the time scale you're accessing is such that most of the lipids are solid-like, but with time there's no reason why that shouldn't tip. And then you have to be very careful of a coding problem that your neighbor list or your, your range of interaction doesn't now intersect. Once that happens, you could have catastrophic collapse. So I would say be careful. So normally what we would do in such is, is allow isotropic fluctuation if we know we're simulating a system that's supposedly a liquid crystal. Um, we, it could be anisotropic because the system is anisotropic, but not to let it flop. Does that help? Yeah, but that's the Right, so that's a question that, that I, I, is, is still to be answered. So one of the things they measure in the x-ray is the spacing between the DNA. In fact, in reality, because of lipid domains, it's one piece of DNA that, that goes through and comes back like some sausage, right? I mean, it, it, but nevertheless, they measure from the diffraction the spacing between that. We only looked at one piece of a DNA strand. And therefore, the spacing between the DNA is something we input. We input the experimental measured value. What I mentioned at the end, which I think is the answer to your question, it'll be very interesting for us to set up two strands and see whether the thing relaxes to the measured, in other words, not constrain it with the experiment. That simulation is set up in the group, and they've run it a few nanoseconds, but it, I think it needs to be run on a lot, lot longer. So that's a good point. Well, that, uh, yes, so, so the question here is whether one could use an artificial periodic boundary to condition to enable lipids to pass from one leaflet to another. I think that's an interesting notion, except in the experimental world, I mean, the time scale for that is seconds or hours. So I don't know how you would actually do that. Even if you allowed that, I, it would have to be driven by some external force, right, or, or be so non-equilibrium that it would want to leap and be asymmetric. Normally, the as I would imagine that the asymmetry is due to, in part, the curvature, or in part due to the fact that the things that are in, a, in the, the cell membrane are themselves not isotropic, so you need to have different numbers. But this is a rhetorical problem about curvature, but that is Ah, okay. Yeah, so... Um, in, in, that, in that sense, but 
the time scale for that flip is, is very, very long. And I'll have a little bit to say about that in the next uh, talk. Thank you. Yes, yes. Yeah, I, uh, in your lecture, I think uh, the molecular simulation can scale with the P limitation for, yes. for further prolong, uh, for further study. I just think um, this kind of waiting for a faster computer and the build, build a computer cluster, after we know exactly um, the time scale of behavior for this liquid, I could we do higher um, abstract models that's that's my next okay. lecture. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> that's exactly what my next lecture is about. <laughs> All right, should we and then All right, what, whatever you want. Yeah. Uh, you used to say to introduce the theme of consistency is uh, the yeah. I mean, that's, that's an interesting, um, interesting thought, and, and there have been many papers about that. So real cell, I mean, just a vesicle, if you want, closed vesicle with just one bilayer. The, it should be tensionless, the so-called flaccid thing that can flop around should be tensionless. And uh, Rich Pastor has written papers um, arguing that because of the boundary conditions that we have, um, artificially you, you have a tension. Um, and I think Rich and I just disagree about that. I, I would say that certainly a real cell or a real vesicle is in this zero tension limit. But what we are modeling in our periodic boundary conditions is what most experiments probe, not all experiments, where you have multilamellar systems. And that you read the papers, that's what they do. And so we're modeling a piece of a multilamellar system, just like a crystal, if you want. And that's what we model. So if you want to study the thing under tension, if that's your wish, then indeed Rich has written papers on the ensemble you need to set also the tension. And I think they're interesting papers in their own right. But from a, from a pragmatic point of view, if you want to do a simulation of a lipid system and compare with an experiment with X-ray diffraction, with NMR, and so on, and with neutrons, then I think what we're doing is correct. I mean, uh, and I'm prepared to argue that. I mean, that's my point of view. No, but there are, there are situations in which having the tension there is interesting. And in a different thing, which I'm not going to talk about, which is what uh, I mean, people, and Steve is involved in, in part, and other people in my group, is studying purely synthetic uh, vesicle-like objects and studying their mechanical properties. And then the issue of the tension comes up. In fact, you would like to do the simulation in a zero tension limit. And so what some of, the, some of them have been doing is doing a range of simulations and identifying what is the particular area per particle that gives you that result. Or alternatively, you could have set up a simulation in an ensemble where you fix the tension. Yeah. So, so I, it's not that it's uninteresting. It depends what you want to do. It is a little difficult to handle because the commutation from the lipid bilayer to the protein is, 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 is pretty slow. So when you are putting tension in the membrane, you thin the membrane and the protein adjusts to that a little bit, but sluggishly, it seems to be better at, the, at this point in terms of our computer advanced for this situation that you would like to see what is the effect of membrane tension, not just on the membrane, but also on the protein that is true that protein alone. Then of course there are the 
Yes. Um, those are very interesting points. The scary thing about these mechanosensitive channels is that you only need one, two, or three, or five atmospheres in it. And, and it's incredibly small. And noise in our simulation is, uh, that's not to say you can't change the, the, the external stress or whatever you're going to apply, but, but um, was it Steve that, that sent me that? Somebody sent me an email in my group giving me a list of channels and the tension you need to apply, which is very tiny. To change, yeah, yes, yes. You see really a target to get through it as a radio, so it is similar to the radio of your whole iPad. And so well, that's a massive system. change, yeah. And that's a pretty strong tension, I think. So uh, there could be some other channels that are much more, uh, more feeble than in the mechanical sensitive channel. So that really prevents uh, a bacterial cell from bursting under osmotic pressure. This releases. Yeah. Well, there's another question there, right? Um, yeah, my impression is that the first generation force fields were only good to say 10% in that number. So when we did a simulation of um, this lipid with the six double bonds, for example, which is an extreme case and is well studied experimentally because it's such a bizarre lipid. I mean, I think our area per lipid was off by uh, they said of order 10 percent, which is a substantial error. Normally the force fields are not that bad. And Alex Mackerel and Scott Feller went back and refitted that. And their instinct was that the parameters for the double bond were not good enough. Uh, I, I don't think they refitted the Hedgewood parameters. Do, do, you, do you know anything about that, Steve? I, I think it's the double bond that, because most of the simulations have had one double bond in them. And what, uh, we know from Stephen White's experiments with neutrons that this double bond has a propensity to go up and see the water more than the normal uh, carbon would. But if you've only got one and you've got six, this is a pathologically different in some sense. And so it was much more sensitive to, to, to the data. But I, I, I think we ran amber in my group and we've run charm. And I, I think they're, they're probably three, four percent Era right now. I oh no, no, no! I think that one you is, is it converges very quickly. I mean the chains. So think of the hierarchy of times. For the, the and and the Carplus group wrote papers on this even before we could do the MD simulations. This time scale of the rocking of the of the lipid is is huge. This is microseconds and beyond. So how long would you suggest uh, that it's uh, purely mechanical simulation? Well, I tried to answer that when we looked at the self-diffusion. So if you're interested in just locally equilibrating a uh, cage around, the cage of neighbors around it, then I think these, um, you know, five nanoseconds is perfectly respectable. Um, if you want to see the thing diffusing around, you're going to have to run more than 10 and probably not 100 nanoseconds, maybe Clausius in theory. 
the answer would be all the ways that for example the nucleus is interlinked to the to this interface and the to the interlinked to the interface and there you have uh only the answer and not the interface. You probably know how it works. Exactly. But the other thing I didn't mention at all, and that's good in this context, is the time for the head group to rotate. And we've sort of studied that, but it's just about good enough to, to get some estimate. And it seems to be three to five nanosecond range. So your lipids haven't even had the ability to flip around. Um, but most of the simulations now do run long enough for that. So I think you have local, equal, local relaxation. I think that's a very good word here. It relaxes to a local minimum, as it were. And I think the area per lipid is robust. I, I, I don't, don't think that's bad. And of course, you've got, that's a single molecule property, and you've got 60 or 100 of these. Yeah. So you actually have good statistics on that. Again, that becomes a sluggish system, so everything was slowed down. Um, um, our work was just this one-shot deal. We did the one paper, it came out in Biophysical Journal. Max Berkowitz has made a systematic study of different kinds of, uh, uh, not just cholesterol, he's put uh, other uh, sterols in, in, in the, and looked at it. I don't think his runs are any longer. Basically, it stiffens the membrane. It's still fluid on some scale, but uh, stops a lot of the, the, the motion. Um, there's an interest in the thickening of the bilayer. I, I didn't elaborate on that, but the dimensions change. And so I'll uh, maybe mention in passing in the next lecture, there is an issue there in the Golgi where you have stacked membranes. I mean, you have stacked bilayers. Uh, the density of cholesterol in different places will alter the thickness of the membrane. And people have suggested that membrane proteins can get sequestered in the bilayer and their solubility, as it were, is adjusted by the thickness of the bilayer. In other words, how big is the hydrophobic region and how does it match to the membrane? And by changing cholesterol, you can actually um, dilate this. And that may help in shuffling things around in the Golgi. But this is a speculation. I mean, this is, uh, there's no hard evidence. But it changes the, all of the properties. Oh, we never studied that. In fact, that would be a beautiful uh, simulation for somebody to do. Uh, I mean, that's kind of a dream, but uh, I think it could be done now. Yes. But that raises the question I did ra ra point out. You need a grand canonical simulation because the hydration level in the gel phase is about 15 waters per lipid, whereas in, in the liquid crystalline phase, it's 25 or so, but you can even swell it, right? People study the spacing as you add more water. In the real world, you have this box and, I mean, your experimental system, and you have solution, and you have even salt in there, and you have these lipid-like uh, multilamellar vesicles, and the whole thing's in equilibrium. And if you change the temperature, water can come in. So you need an open system. So to do that simulation properly, you would need to have an open system. And, and just for understanding, you set up the system by this perfectly right kind of conditions, for example, lipid density, temperature, and that corresponds to one phase or the other phase. Exactly, exactly. You didn't change the temperature to the lipid density to see how it changes. So which, which temperature would change? Would yes, how would, in other words, could you simulate the transitions from, say, the, say the gel phase to the liquid phase? So you would need to have an open simulation system, you, or if you come down, if you wanted to cool it from the liquid crystal phase and watch the chains crystallize, which I think should be possible. To, to compare with the experiment, you need, uh, it's the chemical potential. I mean, you have to actually remove waters. And, uh, oh, I, I'm not aware of that, no, because um, most of these measurements are done with diffraction, right? I mean, this is infinity. I mean, uh, no, I don't know the answer.
Yes, I think most of the papers we've published on these systems uh, compute the membrane potential. And, and it's, um, it's sad to say that the number that comes out of all of these uh, models is not very good. And the same obtains for water. If you do the surface of water with air, as it were, or with vacuum, you calculate the surface potential. Almost all of these empirical uh, force fields give a lousy value for the surface potential. And the same is true uh, here. For memory, it's something like 700 milli electron volts. And uh, the experimental number is probably a third of that or something. I don't have that at my fingertips, but it's, it's typically bad. In the case of the anesthetics, they've measured the change in surface potential when you put anesthetic in the bilayer. So we see the change in the right sense, and, and roughly right. I mean, maybe it's a factor of 50% of it. That's also in one of our papers, I remember. We, so we calculate this. It's, it's one of the things we calculate. But it is way off from experiment. Well, uh, you, you see that in the nature of a, of a summer school, it's great that we can have questions in the participants. But uh, I know that you have a wonderful chef summer school to tell us about force ring simulations. And so we have to go for that. We can maybe go and be a little late because I think okay. if we have still to watch, but still give us. So 